industrial accidents, ancient Solving poisoners, crime, poison prevention. Spills. This is Toxic History. Our first presenter today is Dr. Singyi Feng. She is an associate professor at the UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, who's also been a violinist since the age of six. Today, she's bringing us both her medical and musical background to discuss the hidden toxic world behind some of our great art and great artists of the classical music repertoire. My name is Singy Fang. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. You're very kind. Um, but I was asked to, you know, um, join in this toxic history. It's always been something I've been really interested in. And um, this is definitely a melding of two of my you know, key interests, both obviously my personal side as well as my professional side. And I found that toxicology and classical music definitely was leading to some lethal drug art combinations for sure. Um, so I have no financial disclosures related to this subject to disclose. I certainly hope I don't. Um, and so it all kind of started with Gustav Mahler. Um, and it actually started with a professor of mine in medical school, Dr. Manjuri at Jefferson Medical College in, in Philadelphia, who absolutely was fascinated by Mahler. And I was really just taken that he could, you know, combine his personal passion for Mahler and his medical you know, profession to um, really give some fascinating lectures on how um, Mahler's health affected his art. And if you ever get a chance to go to this particular article that he wrote on how um, his um, health regarding subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis uh, really affected especially his ninth symphony, although he started a 10th symphony, but they talk about the curse of Beethoven symphony, nobody seems to get past nine, um, and how it affected, um, you know, the artistic uh, journey that he went through, especially the last several years of life when he got partic um, particularly sicker and sicker se secondary to his subacute um, bacterial endocarditis. Um, and so, you know, he was actually diagnosed here in the US um, uh, and he was treated with oxygen, caffeine, digitalis, and certainly radium at that time because it was purported to be the miracle treatment at that time. But unfortunately, he died at 51 years of age. And if you ever get a chance to listen to the symphony number no. nine, which we just did, you can hear the imitation of the failing heartbeat that was described by Leonard Bernstein when he recorded it in the 1960s and 70s. And that got me to thinking once I actually did my toxicology uh, fellowship, are there instances of toxicology in music in classical music history? Obviously, we're very familiar that toxicology in popular music has a very long history. Obviously, we hear about overdoses that are you know, closely related to multiple uh, pop music stars. But how about classical musical composers and musicians? Have they gone through similar type of um, intoxications and toxicology? So there's actually an amazing amount of publications on this subject. So books have been written on it. Uh, literature has been on it. And so we'll kind of go through some of them today. So I was able to categorize them into four subjects. So alleged poisonings, suicides, documented toxicities, and finally, there's certainly some that are very controversial as well. So we'll start off with alleged poisonings to start off with. So unfortunately, because they're alleged, these are mostly gonna be conjecture and hearsay. They're often, you know, um, uh, interpreted with salacious or political undertones, and unfortunately, there's no documented proof of toxicity. Probably one of the most famous is Anton Fies, who was from 1733 to 1760, so he had a very short life. So he was a German cellist and a composer and allegedly died from a habit of eating spiders, whom he said tasted of strawberries. Now, needless to say, I tried to find pictures of, I don't know what type of spiders are gonna taste like strawberries, so I just kind of made some strawberry spiders here, so hopefully those actually are safe to eat. So going to suicides, these are gonna be more contemporary classical composers and musicians because historically suicides were often denied by family members as um, other causes of death. So because unfortunately, especially in the West, you know, in the Western world during history, if you were, if you had committed suicide, the church forbade you from having a proper Christian burial. So oftentimes the type of toxin is difficult to pinpoint unless it was outright stated, as oftentimes symptoms have not been published. But one that I did was able to get very good documentation was on a, a absolutely fantastic composer and um, pianist by the name of Noel Newton Wood. 
who was born in 1922 and died in 1953. He was from Australia, although he actually studied in England. He achieved international fame for many distinguished concerto recordings during his very short life. You can hear one here right now, which is on his, um, his Chopin. Um, um, his Chopin concerto recording from the 1950s. Um, so his lover actually uh, tragically died from complications of a ruptured appendix. And so unfortunately, not a few months later, Noel um, actually committed suicide by drinking prussic acid. So what exactly is prussic acid? So let's look at the history of you know, this particular substance. So in 1706, Prussian blue was isolated by Diesbach in Berlin. And they, he had combined potash, which is potassium salts, and blood and created iron ferrous cyanide. And he named them Prus Prussisch Blach or Berlinisch Blach, um, basically meaning Prussian blue and was using this oftentimes in art. So you will see Prussian blue. Um, blue used to be a very expensive uh, pigment used in art. So it used to be lapis lazuli, which is a precious stone, cost an arm and a leg. Um, and then the artist would then pound it um, into a very fine powder Then they would um, suspend in multiple, multiple types of media, be it oil or egg tempera. But once Prussian blue was created, it actually became an inexpensive blue um, color that could be used. So I call it the democratization of art. So then you start seeing artists like Van, Van Gogh here in the, his um, picture, Star Star Night, where he was using a lot of Prussian blue, which would have cost, you know, so much more money than he could have ever afforded for him to have done this with just lapis lazuli. So in 1752, Pierre Macquer, who is a French uh, chemist, postulated that Prussian blue could be converted to iron oxide plus some sort of volatile compound. Um, but he wasn't able to exactly define what that volatile compound was. And it wasn't until 1782 when another German um, chemist by the name of Karl Wilhelm Scheele was able to prepare and isolate the volatile component. So he gave it the, the German name Blossar because of its acidic nature in water and its derivation from Prussian blue. So hence the English translation is prussic acid. So in 1815, Joseph Louis Gay Lussac deduced that prussic acid's um, chemical formula was actually hydrogen cyanide. So cyan comes from the Greek word blue, and then hydro hydrocyanic acid is how that name came about. I'm talking to a bunch of toxicologists, so needless to say, I don't necessarily have to go into the mechanism of how cyanide works. But, you know, we all know that it's a very potent toxin. It can cause life-threatening symptoms in very small doses. Um, exposure to cyanide can cause in a variety of settings, um, such as with smoke inhalation, uh, laboratory and industrial accidents, suicide or homicidal attempts, just like Noel Moon Woods. Um, and it can come in many different forms. So lots of different symptoms with CNS effects as well as um, cardiovascular effects. And again, the toxicity is mainly due to its inhibition of cytochrome B, cytochrome oxidase in electron transport chain. So we're all very familiar with that. So I'm not gonna go too much into that. Um, so here's the obituary that was published in the London Evening News detailing the situation of his death. But it didn't really answer a big question for me. So, you know, they not only, you know, published his obituary, but then they had a memorial concert for him about a year later. But again, nobody really talked about, you know, like, where did he get it from? How did he exactly die? Um, and so um, I actually um, emailed the Royal Academy of Music's library in London, and they were actually able to provide me with the coroner's inquest um, here that was actually published in a newspaper. So um, they didn't say exactly where Noel Newton Wood got his prussic acid, although it was actually very readily available because at that time people used it to fumigate their home um, for, for insects and other kind of pests. So hydrogen cyanide as a pesticide, it was first used in California during the 1880s, but unfortunately we're all familiar with it being as a part of Zykon B. So the B is for the Blessura, which is the German for prussic acid, which was developed in the 1920s and had been used by the Nazis beginning in as early as 1942 during the Holocaust, which they used to kill for an estimated 1.1 million people. So moving on to documented toxicities, these are probably 
probably the most fun for us just because we actually have some documentation. So these are known users and abusers of intoxicants, confirmed use of various types of medications as well as natural toxins that were documented as being used. So we go into the case of an unfortunate gastronomic adventure. So we're going to Johann Schober, who was um, born about 1720 to 1767. He is a German composer and a harpsichordist. He was a court musician for the Count of Ponty outside of Paris. His compositions were studied by a very young Mozart, although the anecdote is that Leopold Mozart told Schaubert that Wolfgang found his music a little bit too easy, easy. Although I find that hard to believe because Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart actually was very heavily influenced by Schaubert and actually used a lot of themes that Schaubert had written um, in his various types of uh, piano sonatas. So according to re the report filed by Jean Maubert, which apparently like it, it was very easy to find all of this, granted it's in French, so I had to read French again, um, but it's all available online. So there was actually a police report that you can discover online that in 1767, the uh, inspector Maubert reported that Monsieur Chaubert arranged an outing outside of Paris with his family and friends. So they went mushroom picking. So they returned that evening with the mushrooms. They asked the chef at a local restaurant to cook them. The chef said, these are poisonous, I am refusing. They went to another restaurant and the maitre d' at that restaurant also refused to cook the mushrooms. However, there was a physician in the party that reassured him that the mushrooms were absolutely edible. So they happily went back to the Chaubert residence where then um, his servants then cooked the mushrooms into a soup and they had a lovely dinner. However, at about noon the next day, a passing neighbor heard strange noises found from the front home. And so then they called the police and they found a household that was in convulsions of pain and struggling against death. So one child had already died. Monsieur Chaubert died four days later. Madame Chaubert died about a week after that. And then the physician friend also perished. So only one child survived. And it was because that child was already ill and had not eaten any of the mushroom soup. So what did the Chaubert family eat? So I definitely think it was one of the Amanita species, most likely Amanita phylloides, although there's a couple more species that had similar toxins that were uh, that are available, that are easily grown in, that are growing in France. So Amanita phylloides is widely distributed through Europe. It's estimated at as little as half of a mushroom can kill a person. And prior to the mid 20th century, the mortality was estimated at about 60 to 70%. And even today with you know, all of the excellent supportive care given by our ICUs, it's still at about a 23 to 25% mortality. So um, it is thought that Amanita thyloides is involved in the majority of deaths from mushroom poisonings from Emperor Claudius of Rome um, to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI. So we are all familiar with amatoxin. Um, the big thing that we know about is certainly that in the late phases, it can cause fulminant hepatic failure. Um, much of like, you know, our um, acetaminophen poisoning. Um, and, you know, that allowed me to think whether Amanita phyllodes was the only toxic mushroom in France. So there's no specific symptoms or, you know, uh, or the particular mushroom that was in the police report. But I think still that Amanita phyllodes is probably most likely since it did take the family a while to pass away. But there's three other deadly mushrooms that are native to France. So Amanita verna and Amanita virosa, which are both in the Amanita um, family, which both contain um, amatoxins. So Amanita verna has alpha amatoxin, and then Amanita virosa has amatoxins and phalotoxins. And then there's Cortinarius orolanius, um, commonly known as the fool's lift cap, which is more acute renal failure with the toxin orolamine. So consequences of misspent youth is our next one, story. So this is the story of Niccolo Paganini, who uh, lived from 1782 to 1840. He is considered one of the greatest violinists um, of, of actually all time. He's the father of modern violin technique. He's really well known for his violin concerto, as well as his 24 caprices for solo violin, which are ridiculously difficult to master. Um, he was a traveling virtuoso during his early career, and his incredible skills with the violin um, earned him the nickname, the devil's violinist. He was also very famous for having a very long, lanky physique and hypermobility and extensibility of his joints. So he was capable of playing three octaves across four strings. So if anybody who is a violinist who's listening should know that the, that is nigh impossible. 
Um, it's been um, theorized that he may have had Marfan or Ehlers Danos. Um, and for a while, this particular photo uh, was, was being um, used as proof that he had this weird physique, although it ended up become, being known that it was actually a fake uh, video. He had concert groupies. Um, he was definitely a rock star of his age. He was known to have the relationship with the occasional prostitute. He had women falling all over him, including Baroness Helena von Dominic. So she deserted her husband and stalked him across Europe. Who, and unfortunately, her family finally confined her to an asylum because she died. He did have a long-standing relationship with Antonia Bianchi. Um, they gave concerts together, and they had one illegitimate son whose name was Achille. So his health definitely took a downturn. So in 1820, he was initially diagnosed with tuberculosis because he had coughosputum, weight loss, hoarse voice. Um, and so they said, okay, you have TB. But in 1822, they actually diagnosed him with laryngeal syphilis. Now, they couldn't confirm this, obviously, because there was no direct laryngoscopy available at the time. The original cough could have been secondary from calomel abuse, which was used as a purgative and a laxative during the 19th century. By 1823, because of his diagnosis of syphilis, large doses of mercury and opium was being prescribed for his health. Now, this obviously had a disastrous effect on his health. He started getting oral abscesses and osteomyelitis of his jaw, but he also continued to take calomel to combat opium-induced constipation. By 1834, he was at the end of his performance career. So he had to cancel multiple uh, performances. He had deterioration of his eyesight. He was constantly drooling. He had um, tremors of his hands. His personality changed. He went from somebody who was very gregarious to somebody who was shy and very easily uh, startled by noises. <laughs> he developed um, strictures of both of his esophagus as well as his rectum. He had urethral stenosis as well. He had ulceration of his palate and that developed several years later and unfortunately died at a very young age of 58 by 1840. So certainly we're very familiar that mercury was used for treatments for many different things. And so it was definitely the treatment of, sort of choice for syphilis at that time. It was used more as a desperation more than anything because nobody really quite understood syphilis and certainly didn't understand the germ theory like we do now. So it was prior to antibiotic age and certainly prior to germ theory. So it was Paracelsus um, from 1493 to 1541 who formulated an ointment with mercury for topical use for syphilis. Um, and he recognized that it was toxic when it was being given as an elixir, but I think people had this like, well, more is better kind of a viewpoint. And so mercury was being used in higher and higher and higher concentrations for these patients with syphilis. So mercury ointment was used well into the 19th and 20th century. So calomel, just to review, um, is um, comes from mercury 2, chloride 2. So the name comes from the Greek for kalos, which is beautiful, and melos, which is black. So it turns black when it's exposed to ammonia. So when taken internally, it's a laxative. It is a disinfectant um, for, for syphilis. It's a teething powder. And then certainly mercury chloride was being used for a uh, fumigate. So they would do colonial, um, colonic fumigation for syphilis as well. And it was actually, uh, pres it was actually uh, described here in this article from 1857 that was published in The Lancet. So I do think that Paganini's symptoms of personality change, constant salivation, deterioration of eyesight, tremors, and oral abscesses certainly go along with kind of the classic findings of elemental mercury poisoning. So I think we have a pretty good uh, documentation of not only him taking calomel, but also him having the symptoms to go along with it. So art imitating life. So um, Hector Berlioz is always a really interesting um, story to tell, both for musicians as well as for toxicologists. He actually was a medical student, but he dropped out of it to enter the Paris Conservatoire de Musique in 1826. And four years later, he won the Prix de Rome, which was France's premier um, music award in 1830. He was a well-documented opium eater. So in 1829, he described his symptoms to his father that you know, when he takes opium, he sees himself in the mirror and that he gets the most extraordinary impressions and the, the effect is, is like that of opium. And later in life that he would take laudanum basically to try to escape life. So laudanum was actually very popular during the 19th century. It's tincture of opium and ethanol. 
Um, it was developed by Thomas Sydenham of Sydenham's Chorea fame. He was a 17th century British physician. He prescribed it to Oliver Cromwell, who had um, basically um, uh, killed uh, Charles I and then took over for um, England as like, the grand protector until uh, Charles II came back onto power after he died. Um, and opium was commonly used as a drug at that time, so it's morphine and codeine. It was either smoked or ingested, oftentimes smoked. So the story of opium, Berlioz, and kind of his obsessions goes to about 1827. So specifically September 11th, 1827. He went to see a performance of Hamlet in the Paris Odeon. And an Irish actress by the name of Harriet Smithson was playing Ophelia, and he instantly fell in love with her. Now he barely spoke English. He obsessively pursued her, even though he never really met her. He persistently sent her letters. He would move to an apartment so he could watch her coming back and forth between her apartment and the, the theater. But like she should, she refused to meet him and he returned to London. So that's he has stalking tendencies. So while she was gone from Paris, he composed an orchestral symphony for her, which is known as the Symphony en Plastique, and premiered in 1830 to celebrate her return to Paris. Um, so he had learned English in the interim, but she wasn't at the performance. So there are five parts of Symphony Fantastique. So the first part is that the, the, there's this idée fixe, fixe, which an artist has this obsession, which is basically Harriet Smithson. The second part is where the artist desperately tries to gain attention of the artist. The third one is that he sees his obsession with someone else and that music then gets more and more frenzied and he turns into a jealous rage. By the fourth and fifth part, however, the fourth one is because he has these visions where he's murdering his obsession. And the fifth one is that his soul then gets taken to hell. So definitely very weird stuff. And it's hard for me to, like, granted he did have stalking tendencies, but it's hard for me to say that, you know, did he, did he just simply because of his stalking, I do think he used opium, which only enhanced all of his kind of weird behaviors. So symptoms that were described by the story in Symphony Fantastique, confusions, drowsiness, hallucinations, impaired judgment, and stupor. And certainly hallucinations have been reported with opioids, um, usually auditory, visual, and very rarely tactile. Morphine has the most reported as the causative agent for opioid-induced hallucinations. Um, and there's been multiple um, reports of morphine and hallucinations reported over the So we're moving into controversies. So certainly Beethoven is one of the top controversies. People still talk about this today. What caused his deafness? That is one of the main stories that I think mysteries in music that we will potentially never know, but there's lots of theories. So to give you a little bit of history regarding his deafness, by age 27, he was having tinnitus. By age 30, he convinced, um, he confessed to a, a physician friend of his that over the last three years, he was having weaker and weaker hearing and that he could not make out the sounds of the music or the words that people were trying to say to him. By 1814, he was unable to carry conversations orally. Um, he tried to use an ear trumpet, but with very limited success. By 1815, he stopped playing the piano completely. By 1818, he was using conversation books. Um, there's many of them that are still preserved. Um, you can see an example here. So where he, people would then write their questions to him and he would answer to them back in orally. By 1822, he stopped conducting. However, in 1824, he actually had what they termed as a last performance. So he was the honorary conductor for the premier performance of his ninth and last symphony. However, during the performance, he was several bars off. And so at the end, he actually had to be turned around to see the audience by the contralto of Caroline Unger. And it, I would have loved to have seen this performance because, you know, it would have been so tragic to see this absolute genius and he couldn't hear the notes that were being performed on that stage or the, or the applause that was being given to him. So he had multiple other health issues as well. Um, by early adulthood, he was complaining of frequent um, abdominal pain. When he was in his 30s, he would have feverish catarrh, which is another word for bronchitis. He was complaining of rheumatism of his hands and his black back. He had tormenting headaches. And then he would have these inflammation of his eyes to the point where he couldn't see. 
During the final year of his life, he was uh, experiencing massive ascites and would have bloody emesis. So what exactly caused his deafness and his death? So there's many disputed illnesses causing his um, death, be from alcoholic cirrhosis, to Whipple disease, to potentially lead poisoning, which is where our interest is. So the pictures here are, this one is a life mask, the one that's on the bottom. The top is a death mask. So a death mask was actually something that was quite commonly done uh, during this time period that after a person died that they would mold a clay mask on top to kind of preserve the person's image. Um, and it, they would also do live masks too as well. So obviously one person is alive, they would do a facial mask on them too to preserve their, um, their images exactly. So he did have an autopsy that was done. Um, it was performed by Johannes Wagner from um, the University of Vienna. Um, found he had some facial nerve enlargement, auditory nerve atrophy. He had some calcium deposits in his kidney. He had liver cirrhosis and atrophy, and his skull showed an unusual thickness, but they weren't really able to determine what exactly caused his death. So in 2007, Christian Reicher, who's a Viennese forensic expert, analyzed strands of his, of his hair and noted dramatic spikes of lead in his hair over the last four months of life that he used to just basically look at the length and try to calculate back from there. So we all know the kind of the issues with looking at hair analysis, not necessarily the most um, reliable you know, way to pinpoint that Beethoven actually had lead. Um, but it was theorized that his that Beethoven's physician was actually giving him lead-based medication for his colicky chronic abdominal pain. And so, and also there was well-documented when um, Beethoven received paracentesis for all of his ascites, and they found spikes of lead correlated um, with known paracentesis that were performed by his physician. So you can see the distribution of lead in his hair as well as all of the different paracentesis. Um, and so, you know, the, then came this book called Beethoven's Hair. There's actually multiple sources of Beethoven's hair. This is another Victorian era um, habit that whenever somebody died, they would actually take a lock of their hair to kind of preserve them. And so there's multiple locks of Beethoven hair because pretty much within the first day of his death, basically he was showing him that people were taking basically um, mementos of, of Beethoven because they wanted a piece of his great genius. So in 2010, um, Andrew C. Todd actually published that he had tested samples of Beethoven's skull that was that is still in um, at the University of Vienna and did not find elevated levels of lead in the bone. Um, but he did not describe a previous, they didn't describe a previous sample that was analyzed by another German group previously. Um, that had three to four times the expected blood level. So um, he used x-ray fluorescence in both samples. And again, we know that lead measurement in hair is not considered reliable for exposure. In 2013, Michael Stevens et al, who reviews musical and medical literature, noted that Beethoven had a habit of inviting lead sweetened wine. Um, he reviewed the pros and cons of arguments of dead lead um, causing his deafness. So we, knew, we know that he was known to enjoy lead sweet wine. He started drinking very heavily after the age of 17, after his mother passed away. Um, he was drinking this wine for about 10 years prior to tinnitus being developed, but then he would drink more wine that was sweetened with lead to stimulate appetite and to try, treat his abdominal pain. He was known to drink a, up to a bottle of wine with each meal. Um, there's actually some very, very famous letters that Beethoven wrote where he was contemplating suicide, um, especially because he was losing his he hearing. So we do know that lead can cause some behavioral changes. His autopsy shows proven hepatotoxicity, kidney damage, and he has a known history of abdominal colic. And then he has lead levels in hair and in one sample in the skull. But again, only one of those samples showed lead levels in the bone. Um, he had a lack of motor disorder, obviously he was playing piano, um, he was conducting, he was obviously writing very significant pieces of music even when he was deaf, he did not have any other neurological symptoms. So again, this is still very much still a theory, it's really fun to speculate, but we don't necessarily know. So in 2001, Rubens et al. looked at, um, in Latvia, looked at 151 workers with inorganic long-term lead exposure. Um, so the, it was between eight to 47 years of lead exposure. These patients had mood disturbances, abnormal liver and kidney functions, and they also had GI symptoms. So again, certainly Beethoven had some of these symptoms, 
but I can't necessarily say that it is an absolute conclusion that we can say that Beethoven had these. Um, so again, we'll never know the cause of Beethoven's hearing loss. Best theoretical explanation for his deafness potentially could be due to the lead that it was in his wine that he drank. But again, he had other medical issues. Is it a combination of the alcohol plus the lead? Did he have tuberculosis? Did he have syphilis? Like, it seemed like everybody else during the 19th century had. Again, I don't think we'll ever know. So, you know, basically toxicology is very much a part of classical music history. Um, did toxicology affect their artistry, their musicianship? Again, we may never know the answer because there's lots of questions. There's lack of evidence, but it's certainly fun to speculate. And that's part of the fun of toxic history. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for being at my talk to get today. Um, and if you have any questions, certainly these are um, my references. Um, and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever questions there may be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fain. It was extremely interesting. Um, I'll just go ahead and look through the chat here, see if there's any questions that have been posted. Certainly, uh, uh, certainly, I've, I've had the chance to play a couple of those pieces and, and kind of the classical music discussion. That it always seems to come up is how much, how much do, do you think that the composer's physical health and mental state really changes the the musical output that they had, or do you think we would have had some of these masterpieces even even in the absence of, say, you know, uh, Paganini's uh, uh, affliction, as it were. I think very much the, the ongoings of the life in a composer are very significant to their art. So I'll give you a great example is the Bach Chaconne, which is part of the solo violin uh, sonatas and partitas, which is a really famous piece. So he, Bach actually wrote that uh, about six months after the death of his first wife. So who actually happened to be his cousin, but I think that was quite common back then. So, um, and, and Bach was a very, uh, how should I put it, productive person, uh, not just musically speaking, obviously he had a lot of compositions, but he actually fathered 20 children. Um, but if you listen to the, the, the Chacon, it is very hard for you to try to separate the two. Another good example is Mozart. Um, there is pieces that he composed after the death of his mother and the solemnity of it, which is very unusual for Mozart. Usually he's pretty happy and light and very classical in nature. But this one particular piano concerto, if you listen to it, there's no doubt that the things that were going on in somebody, a composer's life, are absolutely going to affect their music. Yeah. Um, and then we do have a question in the chat. Uh... We can see if we have enough time to, to get to it, but do you know the reasoning behind using a lead-based treatment uh, for abdominal pain? Certainly it would seem to cause the abdominal pain. So, you know, certainly this is the time that where homeopathy became very popular was in the 1800s. So um, for those of you that know Hahnemann um, Medical Colleges, which is now Drexel, um, was one of the first homeopathy medical colleges here in the United States. So the thought is that you will take a medication that is potentially causes the same issue. So if you have an abdominal pain, then you take lead because it causes abdominal pain. Now granted homeopath, um, homeopathic medications now, it's more about the dilution. So that it's at such a small dilution that potentially it's going to cause the opposite of what's happening. But you know, there's not, there was not a good understanding of medicine at that time. So, you know, like, you know, they would do things like if something looked like a brain, they would eat it thinking that it would be good for their brain. If they ate something that caused abdominal colic, they felt potentially it would, it would neutralize it. So unfortunately, I think, you know, a lot of the medical theory at that time, certainly um, Pasteur wasn't around yet. We didn't understand germ theory. Um, I, the, a lot of the medications that were around were oftentimes um, folk remedies or herbal re um, remedies. People oftentimes went to herbalists or, um, and there were a few medications that were known, but most of the time people did not know that the, you know, like they knew calomel would potentially help and it might have initially, but they didn't know that it was mercury chloride, right? So they didn't know all of the, the problems that were associated with it, unfortunately.